Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who's having something of a mock hami week. If you saw my best of 2021, I declared Pray for Haiti to be the best non-Donda album of the year. Uh, if you happen to catch my guest appearance on Mike the Snare's year-end video, you will see me saying the same thing. And I have to admit that when I was planning on doing this video, and this is going to be a review of Makami's 2016 album HBO, Haitian Body Odor, which was re-released earlier this year, when I was getting ready to do this review, I was nervous. I was nervous for several reasons. One of them is I just, I love Pray for Haiti. And I think it's a, a masterpiece. I think it's a wonderful album. And in the comments, I kept hearing people say, you know, wait till you hear HBO. I mean, that's his real masterpiece. And I was afraid that they were right. I was afraid that I was going to hear that, you know, that Pray for Haiti would be like Wu-Tang Forever and HBO would be like Enter the 36 Chambers, you know, that when I heard like the real, the rawness, the early stuff, that's the best Makami, man. That's what I was afraid would happen. Fortunately, that fear was unfounded. I think that HBO is definitely a great album, but it does not compare to Pray for Haiti uh, one for one. I think it shows the, the building blocks. What would become Pray for Haiti is seen in this early, very substantial work. I think we see the, the beginnings of it, and essentially we see the promise of HBO in Pray for Haiti. I also think that's true in terms of the album's executive producer, for lack of a better term. West Side Gun, who is all over Pray for Haiti, found his confidence in the five years between 2016 and 2021. He found his confidence as a rapper, as a producer selector. I think that the growth of, of West Side Gun is also seen in the, the, the superior quality of Pray for Haiti to HBO. Now, I know I've made some people upset. I've been quite active on the Makami subreddit. It's basically the only Reddit page that, <laughs> that I go to anymore. And, and I know that the other thing I was afraid of was that I wasn't going to like the album at all, sort of on the other scale. I hadn't even heard the album when I bought this print. If you don't know, this is a, a print that Makami made, limited edition print. This is my Christmas gift to myself. Merry Christmas, Professor Sky. Uh, and and I, I got it because of the strength of the image, which I'll get into soon. And I knew that I, I, I would like the image, but I was afraid that I'd have all this buildup to this album. And that when I'd finally listen to it, I would just sort of say, eh, I don't know, it's okay, it's juvenilia. But fundamentally, what I found was that all of my fears were exactly, were exactly misplaced. It is neither a bad early album, nor is it a masterful early album that would see some kind of drop off afterwards. It's this great beginning. It is very raw in a very enjoyable way. I totally understand what people love about this album. And especially if I were paying attention to music back in 2016 and I heard this, I would have lost my mind. It's his, it's the, it's what he's managed to do in every project that I've reviewed. And just so you know, I've, I've been, I get, every once in a while I get uh, messages from people who offer me to give me Makami's catalog that isn't streaming. And I'm very tempted by that, but I'm sort of not doing that on purpose. I figure he's going to dump everything back out again eventually, and I'll get to review it. So I'm sort of allowing myself. So thank you very much for the offers, but I'm trying to sort of follow Makami's strategy, whatever strategy it is that he appears to have with releasing his music and re-releasing it and figuring out ways of making money as an artist without having to debase himself the way most artists have to do to make money. So I can hear on this early album what makes people, what made people fall in love with him, all the same stuff that made me fall in love with him on Play for Haiti, his, Play for Haiti? <laughs> pray for Haiti. You know, his, his street flow, a lot of it's about the drug trade and selling crack, but also very, very smart making references, which you have to be a college professor to understand. And then references, which even if you are a college professor, you don't understand. I mean, I, I went through uh, as best I could all the words on this album, and it's very confusing. A lot of things are lost. He has so many different flows, different ways of singing. Primarily what he uses is that favorite style of rapping, which I just call the ghost face style where not every word means something, but every word has a sound and a resonance with the previous one. Enough of the words matter that it's not just a simple word salad, but it has a kind of relentless, catchy, creative, poetic streak. 
that's not poetic in a sort of ethereal sense, but in a very kind of like, like very uh, emotionally resonant poetry of these words and the way they go against each other. Most of the album was produced by August Fennel. Fennon? I don't know. Uh, wow. I mean, I, I know that I'm, you know, I, I talk a lot about how, I, how my ignorance is profound, and I mean that. I mean that in two different ways. One, I mean there's a lot I don't know, and the other thing is that in that ignorance, there is often something interesting. But I just, I'd never heard of August Fennon, and I looked through his credits. It seems like he's been on a couple other projects I've heard, um, but he should be in the mix. Why isn't he in the mix with, you know, with, the, with Conductor Williams and, and all the other, you know, Nicholas Craven and all these interesting Griselda-related producers who are making great underground, gritty hip-hop beats? I wonder why he fell off or why he disappeared because, or if he disappeared, please tell me in the comments. Uh, Sky, August Fannin released three dope projects in the past two weeks and you missed them. <laughs> it's entirely possible. Uh, but I really enjoy his production. It, it, it works perfectly with, uh, with Makami's style, with his laid back, interesting, intellectually strong, yet streetwise flow. So before I get into the album, I have to talk about the angel on my shoulder. The devil on my shoulder? The human being on my shoulder. Michelle Bennett Duvalier. In order to really understand this album in a larger sense, you need to understand this album in the history of Haiti. I think. It's very confusing. It's part of what I like so much about Makami is, you know, he's from Haiti and grew up in New Jersey, part of the Haitian diaspora that got kicked out for reasons, or that left for reasons which I will explain relatively soon and for which the American government bears a large responsibility. The way that he integrates Haitian history uh, uh, is very ambiguous. As a French professor, part of me wants it to be more clear, wants him to state his thesis clearly and follow up that thesis with supporting evidence. But he doesn't. He throws in these items, these mentions, and it's in a way where I can never quite pin it down, which, by the way, is how all of his lyrics are as well. I can sort of understand them, but can't fully pin them down. So why did he choose this image of Michelle Bennett Duvalier? This is an image from her wedding in 1980 to her husband, Jean-Claude Duvalier, also known as Baby Doc. I implore you to read about the history of Haiti. Haiti, the Aftershocks of History by Laurent Dubois is a good place to start. If not, watch some YouTube videos. If not, listen to some podcasts. If not, just go on Wikipedia. It's great. <laughs> Give yourself an hour on, on the Wikipedia, the history of Haiti. It will blow your mind. It is the most interesting country in world history. It, it's, it's, it, you, you, you just you can't believe it. You can't believe the scope and the drama and the tragedy, the constant, fascinating, evolving human tragedy of Haiti in all of its different forms. She is one of the most interesting figures in that history. So if you don't know, the Duvalier was, uh, was a father and a son. So the original Duvalier, Papa Doc, started off as a doctor who actually helped cure diseases, was a great guy, great country doctor, who then became a bloody, terrible dictator. He died, and his son inherited president for life at age 19. There's a lot of bad ideas in world history, but having a 19-year-old inherit president for life has to be up there very, very high. Now, he married much later. <laughs> I'm telling you, her dad tried to kill her future husband, no. Her ex-husband's dad tried to kill her second husband's dad. That's how kooky uh, Haitian history is. So she was this American-educated, beautiful, refined, and this is an important detail in Haitian history, a fairly light-skinned, highly educated woman who represented a lot to the people of Haiti in terms of her beauty, in terms of her grace, in terms of, as we will see, her greed. Uh, and, and the color of her skin did factor into the way that she was uh, seen. Uh, if, you, if you want to better understand the nature of colorism, 
in uh, people of African descent's uh, lives, you could do no better than to study the history of Haiti, which gets so complex that you just can't believe the level of detail, the, the way in which oppression can spread and multiply and take different forms according to the different shades of darkness on your skin. So what is she? Like, what does she actually represent? I mean, when I see this image, you know, I've studied Haitian history, I immediately locate it to that, that wedding, this lavish wedding that was aired on national TV in 1980 with Baby Doc, who was just this pudgy, like any son of a dictator, just kind of pudgy, entitled, and spoiled, and, and kind of rotten. You know, without any of the sort of the, the grand scope, I started from nothing and I arrived here of the father. But her, she's the one. She's the one that, that Makami is focusing on. I, I think it's because of what she can represent, of what happens throughout Haitian history. And I would add world history, but Haitian history in particular, where figures that seem good figures that seem hopeful get consumed by greed or consumed by a lack of a superstructure that will support goodness. I don't know what to describe it or how to say it, but the history of Haiti and Haitian history is basically, okay, great, here comes a great person. Oh, geez, uh, they turned into a terrible dictator and they killed a whole bunch of people. Oh, but here comes a great person to replace them. Oh, well, they kind of turned. Now, throughout this history, this is always constantly uh, through the pushing and the urging of the American government or the French government or other governments which have never been happy with Haiti's existence in the first place. But the way that she is used is fascinating because she is, as a, as a French historian, I can tell you she is the 20th century Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette the wife of Louis XVI, was widely hated before the French Revolution. And during the French Revolution, they would sing all these songs about how she was a prostitute and about how she was sleeping with everybody and how she wouldn't sleep with the king and how she was this terrible, evil influence. She ended up being a scapegoat because I think she was a woman and we could, people could push out their misogyny onto this woman, but also because her opulence and her beauty were so famous that once that opulence and beauty becomes a symbol of something evil, there's like this anger. It's not quite the same thing as like a powerful man who has power and then that power turns bad. But when the beauty and when the grace turns into something evil, there's some kind of reaction to it. And she represents so much of this as this symbol of Haitian wealth and extravagance of a country that was extremely poor. And... and and where the wealth gap was extremely high, but very few people had wealth in the first place. And she represented those people. It was because of her actions and her, well, it was because of her husband's actions. It was because of the way the American government supported her husband's actions. It was the way that most of the world turned a blind eye that led to many of the great Haitian diaspora <laughs> Uh, great Haitian exiles in the first place. Her behavior and her attitude and, and her relationship towards money and her relationship towards the country is part of what brought Makami to America to make this album in the first place. So I'll get more into that. I will. There are a lot more interludes about Michel Duvalier, uh, and I'll get more into detail when we listen to those interludes. For now, I'd like to start with my stand for the album, my favorite track on the album, it's not even particularly close. The song is called Plenty. Now the beat is probably my favorite part of it. It's got this Western harmonica, this sped up voice, and I did a little bit of research, and I'm happy to say I found where this sample came from. It took me a long time to figure, I looked around on the internet, I couldn't find anyone else who found it. So August Fanon really deserves a tip of the hat for this insane, sample. It's a drum beat that he puts underneath a sped up sample from a Twilight Zone episode. Episode 32 of season 5, Garrity and the Graves. The voice that you hear of the person saying, he's down the cemetery, is Percy Helton as the character Lapham speaking. Now I have it here. I drew it up on Hulu. You'll see that I had an edit because every single time you do anything, like you even think about the word Hulu, they put a 
Geico commercial on there. So I didn't want to show you any Geico commercials. So here is the actual clip. And if you know the song, you can hear it. even these bells, ding, ding, in the back that I thought was some kind of like nautical sound comes from this episode of The Twilight Zone, Garrity and the Graves. Just awesome. Just an amazing find, an amazing sample. And what's cool is even at times some of that Western themes will come into the rhyming itself. Makami opens up this spoken weird intro that has some Creole mixed in it. That sound, he still have the cemetery in there. A super hard verse right off the front. Griselda Leopard Zaire shirt. So he makes a reference to like a, a leopard shirt and then Zaire, the former country of Zaire before it became known as Congo. Mabuto Sesi Seko was hard on measures. Get the F off my pyramid. So he's talking about the leader of Zaire, the terrible, terrible dictator, Mabuto Sesi Seko. There's a whole theme of terrible dictators all the way through this album. Mabuto Sesi Seko, Idi Amin, the Duvalier. <laughs> Uh, later, at the end, he says, you owe us. And it seems to me that, that there is a certain element of consciousness here about the way that uh, the white world has oppressed the black world. I feel that that's what he's saying when he says, you owe us. Uh, he has kind of, a, kind of a biggie flow at the end as well, where he says, you, we can stop up your breeding. He, he sort of goes between a lot of different styles of flows, but the differences are always quite, uh, quite gentle or quite subtle. The chorus is excellent, the work is plenty, but the hands are few. An interesting idea. How many semis can you fit up in the van with you? A lot of themes of isolation, of only being able to count on himself. And then the second verse is just insane. <laughs> Opens up with the line, Python Kundalini. Now this is a great example of the kind of thing that, that Ghostface is capable of doing, that Makami is capable of continuing. Just starting off a line with the words Python Kundalini, like what, what the hell is he talking about? And I did some research on that as well. Kundalini originally comes from Eastern mythology and religion. In Hinduism, Kundalini is a serpent-like energy that supposedly rests in, th uh, in three and one half coils at the base of the human spine. Kundalini. So he's talking, so this, this sort of odd spirituality, which is often mixed in with some Haitian spirituality, you know, voodoo uh, spiritualism, mixed in with themes of Christianity. In the middle of this verse, madman, all hope abandon ye who enter through the velvet rope-a-dope. So abandon all hope ye who enter here, of course, is reference to Dante's Inferno. So he's going to going around from, from Hinduistic religions to Dante's Inferno. <laughs> Abandon all hope, ye who enter through the velvet rope-a-dope. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do know. He's that smart. He's that smart. He's either that smart or his mind works in this kind of connection. He just mentioned Zaire and Mabuto Sesi Seiko earlier in the song. If you're like me, you don't have a ton of references. You know, you know who Mabuto Sesi Seiko is. You feel proud of yourself for that. But you might not know much more other than, well, of course, there was the rumble in the jungle, you know, where Muhammad Ali fought George Frazier. And that was where George, that was where Muhammad Ali won, despite the fact it looked like he was losing. He was just trying to get George Foreman tired. And George Foreman kept punching and punching and punching and punching and punching. And Muhammad Ali, like, kept on hanging back. And then at the very end, after George Foreman was tired, he all of a sudden got all the energy and knocked him out. What do we call that? What do we call that strategy of... Like, that was an invention of a strategy of boxing. Oh, that's right. It's called rope-a-dope. Abandon all hope. <laughs> Madman, all hope abandon ye who enter here through the velvet rope-a-dope. Your weakness precedes your hand when opposable thumb can only separate from drum pattering. I break bread when I recite right, shatter them, glass jaw, babbling hype, but gun battling. 
glass jaw, back, back again to the boxing metaphors. All of a sudden, right now, while I'm recording this, I didn't make that, by the way, I didn't make that connection, the rope dope thing, until I started recording right here, after getting really mad about the damn Geico commercials. You know, like, that's part of the problem of doing any video about music that's this rich, is I'm gonna to listen to the album again tomorrow and be like, damn it, I should have said that. A great punchline in this, in this uh, kind of the humor of Makami in this album as well. Uh, it's like too many chiefs, not enough Indians in this piece to build peace. So playing on the word peace and it's different meanings, too many Indians and not enough chiefs um, is, you know, too many chiefs, not enough Indians is the sign that too many people think they're the leader when they're not the leader and you need more people just to follow the leader, sending himself up as a leader. Another theme that goes throughout this album, what is the nature of leadership? And then we get the great Makami, yeah, sound. And then the whole thing ends with a complete sample from one of these kids is doing their own thing from the Sesame Street. I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I teach French and often there will be exercises like that in French books. One of these kids is not like the other. One of these kids is doing their own thing. And kids today don't know about Sesame Street. So I've had to abandon that. But this is just this beautiful long sample from Sesame Street. And I think there's this album has a sort of a portrait I think you can can develop of who Makami is. And maybe it's because we're around the same age, I think. He's probably what, five years younger than me. I'm not sure. I'm in my mid-40s. Uh, he's definitely not like a youngin, right? Where I, I can sort of like get a sense of his upbringing through different references that he makes. And I think this Sesame Street is very clearly, I can sort of imagine him as a kid maybe in Newark watching Sesame Street and seeing one of these kids is doing his own thing and that's who he is. He is one of these kids who is doing his own thing. Twilight Zone, Sesame Street, Muhammad Ali versus Frazier, African Dictators, <sighs> all together in this amazingly hard beat with these amazingly good rhymes. Makami is an icon, end quote. Now I'll go through the rest of the album, maybe not even a little bit quicker, might be a little bit quicker. My, my son's band has band practice today, so I might have to edit again. This is not gonna be a habit, by the way. I'm not gonna start editing my shows. I wouldn't do three shows a week if I had to edit them, Jesus. But uh, there's a new microphone though. What do you think of that? Can you hear? Okay, the opening track is T. Gerald. Ridiculously awesome intro. I think this must be part of the reason why people love this album so much. It's this smoky, rough bass hitting octaves and this slow guitar line just lets it ride. It reminds me of like the Stooges or like Five to One by the Doors. Just like this, just, just really low, really atmospheric. You just get plunged into almost a kraut rocky proto punk beat, and then his verse comes in. It kind of a, sort of a thinner register. It's like different ways of like using like the density of his voice. It's kind of a thinner register, and a great chorus of saying over and over again, uh, "You're you're the best, Lord. You're the best, Lord." When the second verse starts. It sounds almost like unintentional, like like he wasn't even planning on rapping, but he just started saying what he says. Yo, you ain't never play no chicken cacciatore. That, what? You never play no chicken cacciatore. Okay. Pinching dimes and some nickels with a pissed still packing shorty. How meteoric, you mediocre. You had the Maurice. I had the Pradas with the air holes, the Fantasia, Mickey Mouse cabanas. Mm, wish they had a pair of those. I don't know what all this is going on here. I, like this is the the beauty of this style of lyricism. We're like, I know what chicken cacciatore is, pinching dimes and nickels. I assume that has to do with like maybe selling drugs. And you had the Maurice, I had the Pradas. Is he maybe making reference to Maurice the Pants Man, the the, the clothing store that was popular in the '90s? I went to college with Maurice's grandson. True story. Nice kid. Then we get the first interlude, uh, the end of this first song with this description of the Duvaliers and that the most important thing for the second generation was money. And this is a, an important historical detail. And when I teach the history of Haiti, I talk about this. Duvalier was interested in power and control and money. Baby Doc was interested in money, money, and money. It was just money, it was just corruption. And she was an extension of that corruption. And of course, if there's a man and a woman the woman is always going to be the person who society really points their finger at as being the most greedy, the most ruthless, and the most corrupt. 
The next song, Tunnel Vision, starts off with the intro saying to spend money while you're alive. Another one of these themes about money that goes to the album. These, uh, an amazing beat. I wrote before I did any research. I said like, you know, this is like almost like an avant-garde. Like these like like heavy horns and some piano, just an amazing beat. This sort of like I wonder if this is kind of like comes from art music. It comes from Frank Zappa. <laughs> it's a Frank Zappa sample. I don't. I think this is the only Frank Zappa sample that I know of in hip hop history. There must be more. Please tell me in the comments. Um, but it's pretty crazy to have a Frank Zappa sample. His music is very complicated, it's very challenging, and it doesn't lend itself to hip hop, one would say, but it works here too. Oh, you're a gully? Oh, well, we're a gully too. I don't know what that means. Another one of these beautiful Makami lines that he gives, or I don't know what it is. I hope it doesn't mean something bad because I plan on infusing this into my general vocabulary. Hey kids, you gully? Good, good, I'm gully too. I don't know, oh, Jesus, what could it mean? I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say it. Like, what if it means like something terrible and racist or sexist or who knows what it means? I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments. Uh, Creole kind of gets thrown in here as well. Um, I believe he says, based on my uh, limited ability to sort of word by word translate from Creole, I believe he says a saying, which is fish trust the water, but also get boiled in it which is an interesting way of expanding on this sense of isolation and feeling like you're always about to be turned on. A very great flow on the second verse, just very raw. My mm, west side tore me off the cross. All you saw was white meat, skin hanging off. I believe that's a ghost face uh, quote. Ben's taken off, dogs, Mac 10's ringing off. Been breaking off broads, that's 10's, pay the cost. <laughs> you call on tech support like the geek squad, like a restaurant, we might eat y'all, mad delicious, peace y'all. Just that that relentless flow with all these interesting words and call outs and geek squad and restaurant, eat y'all. The next song, 1080p, is the weakest track on the album. I think it's, I think it's my least favorite Makami song ever. It's like an okay beat, but it's like a very standard, uh, slowed down uh, sample, very standard drum sample. Family's what you make it. I guess I like that line. But don't let your street start smarts make you an R word. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't know. It's uh, I'm going to keep going. Because the next song is Plenty, which I've already discussed and I love so much. Then we get to Bay 6, the first song not produced by August Fennon. Uh, this has the opening where he says, I got HBO, Haitian body odor, and it smells like dough. And let's take a second to think about this title. There is a, you know, there is a real meaning to this. You know, this is something that a lot of Haitians had to, you know, were told existed, were told that they smell a certain way. This was a term that was used, a racist, pejorative term, ig uh, uh, an ignorant, immigrant shaming term. And I love the way that he's taking it and repurposing it and making it something that he's proud of, that that smell smells like money. His delivery on this reminds me a lot of, of Drake. Now, I understand that Drake is, you know, Drake. Drake is whatever, certified, you know, lover, <laughs> certified lover man, Ugh. you know. Um, but I, I think there's a fair amount of influence on Makami from Drake. I just felt like a thousand Makami heads get so mad at me for saying that <laughs> because they're sort, of, they're sort of the opposite of each other. But I don't think they are, actually. You know, I think in a way, they're both kind of interestingly linked as being sort of children of immigrants or, you know, tied into an immigrant story and playing with some of the sounds from the Caribbean, uh, senses of alienation. Um, I mean, you know, I, I wish there was some backup for that theory in the song. Oh, right, there is. He actually says, I'm on my drizzy-ish, no new friends, no new bends, because ns in my city like to snow you in. Yep, Mercedes, you got to get some bread with the ladies. You know some mm, when the feds that went to bed, I went to Haiti. So he directly references Drake and the theme of having no new friends. And when Drake is at his best is when he's rapping. And when he's rapping, he's mostly rapping about not having any friends. So it does make sense. He repeats the verse again later, and then the outro has iced tea on Arsenio Hall. Now, I'm talking about these different cultural markers that make me know that, <laughs> that Makami is my age. I mean, he'll never age because he wears the mask, right? So you can, he, he's like Daft Punk, right? When, he, when he's 60, people will think he's 20. 
because you know you're, how, how can you tell um but our, it's great because Arsenio Hall was great he was an amazing figure in late night tv uh he was uh, very important as a as a different voice in late night TV, often bringing a voice to African Americans, and then just also having Ice T and remembering who Ice T used to be, before he was the guy on 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 that cop show who'd walk into the room saying something, you know, snarky like he is now on CSI. Before that, he was the controversial guy who had the cop killer song, which was all about, you know, killing cops, and he was a heavy metal crossover from hip hop. But before that. He was the architect of gangster rap. You know, him and Schooly D, they're the guys. You like gangster rap, thank those two guys. The themes of, of money and crime and making it and using your intelligence to get ahead and being ruthless. That, that same guy who was on one of those Geico commercials that, that interrupted my thing with the lemonade stand and all that, and Ice-T. Like, that's who Ice-T was. So I love having, I love the fearlessness of including Ice-T in a sample. Because even five years ago, Ice T was just a was just a, a a used to be important figure in hip hop who had traded in his monumental influence in hip hop for mainstream success as a police officer of all things. But I very much like having him here. Makami appears to be very conscious of the fact that he is a part of a continuum. And I think he's a continuum of. I think he is a continuum of gangster rappers, but not in the way that gangster rappers transformed like gangster rappers up through and including B uh, biggie and jay-z but not past that point like not in the sort of modern trap house gang affiliated trap beat but more in that that ruthlessly intelligent side that came up with nwa and eight ball and mjg and all those guys okay I'll develop this theory more as I go along. The problem with these videos about Makami is I just have so much to say and I don't even know all the stuff I'm going to say. So, next song, Midnight Express, featuring Conway of Griselda. Um, very funky, uh, 70s kind of soundtrack sound. Um, like this piano and this sliding up guitar. Great flow at the beginning. I mean, just right off the bat, right off the bat, Makami work. I got the little Uzi in the vert. Got a little movie with the earth. That b a bird. Got a little Scooby in the dirt. Got a little Moody with the shirt. Recipes dope. F a jail. F your enemy slow. F and L. F a sentence. Keep low. Peep flow. Engine running like a koala with a Civic fronting like Obama in the Senate. Just going on and on with these words. Scooby in the dirt. I don't know what it means. And this is why I love that he refuses to allow his lyrics to be published and discussed on Lyric Genius. We are in the position that I was in in the 90s when I would hear Supreme Clientele by Ghostface or when I hear anything by the Wu-Tang Clan and the lines like, we eat fish. I didn't know that fish meant cocaine. I thought the Ghostface killer just liked fish because it was a sign of like liking to eat fish. I don't need it to be highlighted and explained. We eat fish and make rap ballads. Cool. I like eating fish too. For Christmas Eve, uh, my wife made a, a, a Serbian specialty called drunken carp. It's made with uh, sherry. It's very, very good. I eat fish too. Here, Conway on here, uh, got sort of his Puff Daddy style of kind of laughing at you. It's a very solid verse from Conway, but much like we will, s like basically, I think the, the difference between Pray for Haiti and, and HBO can largely be seen as the difference in just how Griselda itself has evolved. Because Conway's verse here is fine and his voice is fine, but right now he's on a whole nother level. And, and Westside's nowhere on this album, even though he was you know, behind the scenes and he's all over Pray for Haiti. Michelle Mabel is with Keisha Plum. Another thing why I think we should appreciate what Griselda's doing, because at the same time as they're doing all this street stuff and they're bringing back the crack rap and Benny the Butcher is signing Pyrex bowls and, and all this kind of goofy, super cracky, cracky crack stuff, um, they're also like constantly employing these poets like Keisha Plum, who's doing this spoken word piece here or A.A. A. Rashid on other projects. Um, it, it really feels like they're keeping young poets or poets in work. And here Keisha Plum becomes almost like the voice of Michel Duvalier. 
arrogant as Michelle Bennett Duvalier, she caused the fury of a nation, uncontrollable greed, insatiable lust, irresistible decadence, depravity, her beauty idolized, conflicts with morality. So really the complexity of this figure she is getting at here. Mock Marcy, produced by Rock Marciano. I know, before you put in the comments, Sky, why have you never reviewed Mock, Mock, uh, Rock Marciano? I just, I missed it. Whenever his album came out, I missed it. And I might get to it eventually, but I'm sure he'll release something again and I'll review that. Uh, this is cool because it starts off with a beat that goes nowhere. Like he doesn't rap on it. Then a second beat comes in with a siren. Uh, very funky 70s beat with an attacking flow from Mock. Kind of reminds me more of his uh, his dump projects, his EPs. It's just one verse. It's just sick as hell. He just, 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 just goes at it. My grandfather had to leave her. You hope nowadays try and hit you in the shower with the Zika. Make a friend kick a hole in your speaker. Enough machine death to hit your car door with the FIFA. Teacher, teacher, we don't need no education. All we want is Nicole's and Teresa's. F around, get your head whopped. Some mm's do the snake, some mm's do the running man when shells pop. <laughs> Shell tops with the shoelaces, without the shoelaces, when the bell drop, guys getting shot with Thorazine in the cell block. So much is happening here. Like references to the Zika virus. Uh, hit your car door with the FIFA, like, like the, like the soccer league, teacher, teacher, all we want is Nicole's and Teresa's. I sort of know what that might mean. And then when people, when the shells pop, people get shot, some people do the snake, some people do the running man, there's different kinds of dances. Uh, it might even be a reference to a Nos song, I think. It might be a reference to a line in Made You Look. Anyways, and then guys getting shot with Thorazine in the cell block, talking about how, how some people in jail uh, get get sedated. And this whole verse, this whole attack verse, and this one verse song keeps going. Y'all had the first theorem with the rat fur. I had the Canada goose get found in the trash, sir. Bachelor. East Solomon with the coyote. We argue and we sneak the margarine inside the bogies. Every single line, I could just sit here and do this kind of poetic, like, hmm. East Solomon with the coyote. We arguing, sneak the margarine inside the bogies. What does any of it mean? I'm sure it means something. I don't think he's just throwing out words here. It's all coded. But fundamentally, what matters to me is just how that sounds. We sneak the margarine inside the bogies. You smoke that by mistake, you get a crack high. Matlock, you try and solve the case, but it's a wrap. That's why we splash the border lace up the crash spot. That's why. That's why. Oh, that's why. All that stuff that you said that doesn't make any sense to me at all. First theorem with the rat fur. <laughs> That's why. Next song is HBO. Has a great soul sample. I've been so down. I, I mean, I don't think this is intentional. It might be a reference to just the history of Haiti. Just being so down and being so treated so poorly. Great soul horns here. Again, great work from August Fannin. Um, a fun reference to Griselda here. I heard you kids avoid mock like celery. Griselda got the buffalo wings, the F you telling me. So a reference to buffalo wings, like the chicken wings that you eat that come with celery. So you avoid him like celery because you want to eat the wings, the chicken, not the celery. But then Griselda's from Buffalo and this is his first project with Griselda. So he's paying homage to where they come from. So like calling himself celery, like that's how tough he is. And then they're it's awesome. It's funny. It's it's cool. Um, last verse, he kind of starts and then gives up. He's like, why should I even do another verse when you're still trying to process this one? Then it goes on to an outro with how Michelle spent her money, fur coats. She, build, she built refrigerators so that people who bought fur coats in France would have a reason to wear them in the tropical climate of Haiti, right? The climate of Haiti is the reason that Haiti has been so mistreated in the first place. If they never figured out how to raise sugarcane in Haiti because of the tropical climate, it never would have been enslaved the way that it was, never would have been exploited the way that it was, never would have had such a crazy buildup of population and then destruction of means of production of sugarcane through the destruction of the, of the factories in the slave revolt. You know, everything about Haiti really comes down to its, its geography. And so the idea of having a, the, the ostentatiousness of wearing fur coats in Haiti 
and paying to have them refrigerated is the most decadent thing you could possibly imagine. But let's put this back in the other context of it being a hip hop album. What is hip hop if not, well, at least modern hip hop, if not constant displays of extravagant wealth, like intentionally wasteful wealth, talking about how much you have, can't wear the same thing twice, have this and that and that and this, and I got houses I don't own and cars I don't drive. It is the other bizarre aspect where I think we're seeing Michelle as being something of a rap star, someone who's flossing so hard with such disregard for the people underneath her that it's impossible to even comprehend. Next song, Snow Beach, which I did some research, is a kind of jacket that uh, Raekwon wore, Raekwon wore in a Wu-Tang Clan show, and it's like a very rare polo jacket. More soul horns, simple soul sample in the back. Um, he makes this one reference, I'll wait outside your house and watch you like the Stasi. So, you know, the Stasi is the secret police of the East Germans. Now, I'm an educated guy, but I never would have, I don't think I would have known the word Stasi if I hadn't happened to go to East Germany like a couple years ago, you know, 20 years ago. Well, you know, what, what's now East Germany? You know, like it's such a bizarrely specific reference that shows an intelligence that's pretty insane. <laughs> this, that, David Crockett, Davy Crockett raccoon tail wrap. I don't know why he's making reference to Davy Crockett. Shred a copy like Kinko's. My mm, mock homie bought a choppy just to iron out the wrinkles. You play, you play with balls like Pachinko. I cocked the Cinco. <laughs> so like this reference to Pachinko is like a, a Japanese gambling game, which you don't know about unless you've been to Japan or you really study like, like Japanese history. So like East German history, American history with Davy Crockett. And then we have Japanese culture all thrown in here. I cocked the Cinco, I assume meaning a 45 pistol, the five there. Just the, the amount of things where like, in order to fully understand all of Makami's raps, I think you just have to be Makami. There can't be that many people who are this familiar with knowing the ins and outs of being a, a crack dealer and the ins and outs of like world history. And you know, like there's, there's this sort of like this double intelligence, which is not shared by many people, which might make it alienating for other people. Might be, might, might be alienating where you think like, geez, this guy is like smarter than me in like three different ways. <laughs> Fresh Off the Boat is the next song. Pretty important as a title. Uh, Fresh Off the Boat, because so many Haitians came here on a boat without sanctions. Uh, the word in Haitian for someone who came off the boat is boat people in English because that was considered to be a scourge. We'll get into that soon, how we are responsible for the boat people that came to our country. Um, and it opens up with a great quote from Ice-T about being hip as being intelligent. The lethal weapon is the mind. And that's another reminder of what made Ice-T so great before he just became a, a shill in a propaganda show uh, where you know he was about being intelligent and about being strong with his mind. Great, fully jazzy beat, uh, kind of smoky keyboards. Makami makes a reference to the album Stakes is High by De La Soul, one of the great underrated De La Soul albums, but all of De La Soul albums are underrated because <laughs> they don't stream because there's all the copyright problems. A great break in the first verse with just saying that's so sad a couple times with an echo on it. He does a lot of this kind of like conversational echo stuff where you just kind of feel like he's just relaxing in the studio. Very cool. Haitian hopped out the wraith with this team with them aqua asics no conversation i cop the raven i'm not complaining i don't know what this is but i just very much like the reference to asics uh which he he talks like like asics and and like often and it's a weird brand because who, no like everyone reps like like maybe reebok but it's like always nike or some kind of boutique shoe but he always talks about uh about asics and then he sets up a couple things on this track as well he says, F you pay me, which will come back later, a quote from Joe, uh, Joe Pesci's character in Casino. And then he says, pull up in the Tesla, listening to some 94 Biggie. Now he raps a lot about his Tesla. This is 2016 when it meant something to have a Tesla more than it does now. And then he mentions Biggie and Biggie will come back as well. The entire album is done is has this level of, of texture and connection between different lines, between different points in like, 
he makes references here that will come back somewhere else. My, my son's band is here, so I'll have to do this video later, but I want to do it justice. So I'll get to the next song, F U, hopefully later today, after the band is left. The lighting will be all different, but it's okay. Have good practice. Looks like I'm gonna have to wait until tomorrow to finish filming this. What the hey, I'll give it a shot. I have this new app on my phone that came with a microphone, which is allowing me to get more light in, so maybe it'll work after all. Let's talk about the next half of the album with the song F U. Now this is another song which I think is not as good as the rest of the album. Kind of a nice sloppy organ sample, which is fine, but all the lyrics, they're all about his girls and all about the girls that he has all over the world. Now on the one hand, it's an excuse for him to sort of show off and show off about what he knows about the world. Like as an example, he talks about someone from Uganda and saying how she was on her Idi, like Idi Amin, the dictator. But then it becomes like this extended metaphor about female ejaculation. And it's kind of the nature of the song where he's kind of bragging about how worldly he is and all the places he's been and all the women he's been with, while at the same time just settling for a bunch of weird sexist sex jokes. There is an interesting element though here, and that is the inequality between him and these women. The women constantly mistake him as being from somewhere else. Like someone thinks he's from Jamaica when he's from Haiti, and someone thinks he's from Atlanta when he's from New York, I mean from Newark, and New Jersey. And it's a kind of weird thing where he's kind of flexing on these women that he knows more about than they know about him. I'd say that's a mode he's often in where he's the one who knows stuff and everyone else just doesn't know. I will sip my hot honey water here. But then we get to the, uh, the end of the album, the end of the song, which has this list of things that he needs to presumably treat cocaine or make crack. Uh, and it's just that, that weird laid back echo that happens. And you get, get me some boric acid, acid. And it's part of the laid back, cool nature of this album where sometimes this, this echo effect is just used to put you in this relaxed mode. While in between the time where I was, you know, recorded the first part and this part, I was thinking about that opening again and just how that opening puts you in such a mood. I guess the kids would call it a vibe these days. It puts you in that mood for just this gritty, grimy thing. The next song, Terzetta Era Max, fortunately is a huge leap forward. <laughs> Another one of the best songs on the album. It includes basically the entire instrumental, again produced here by, uh, by August Fannin, is a notorious B.I.G. quote. You got me mistaken, honey. Not to be confused with a good meal, you got me my steak and honey. And this is matched beautifully with a jazz beat. I'm reminded of Plenty, how he managed to get the drum beat to go along with the crazy Twilight Zone sample. That's what we have here with you got me mistaken, honey, and this great jazz going on. Then the vocal, that vocal sample comes out and then the, the verse is just no drums, just this jazz. And he just has a really ridiculously strong verse with a great flow. The words weave in and out of clarity of things I'm able to understand. Slime dollars megatronic like a cholo. <laughs> just, I mean, I know cholo is a somewhat derogatory, potentially racist term for, I believe, Mexican Americans, but slime dollars megatronic like a cholo. I transform about it. You buy the farm for smiling at an auto. Very unclear what he's saying, but just beautiful lines over and over again. The second verse makes direct reference to Wally shoes you know, Clark Wallaby sneakers. Uh, it's interesting because uh, for some of these lyrics, I have managed to find these lyrics here or there. You know, if you search hard enough, uh, you can find some lyrics. And this had a big question mark uh, that they didn't know what Wally's was. And this is where you have to go back to knowing about Ghostface Killer in one of his best verses where he talks about blood on my Wally's like ketchup. And it's uh, uh, just another, I think it's an intentional reference that anytime you say Wally's, I mean, Ghostface Killer calls himself the Wally champ, uh, you know, you're making a direct reference to that school of hip hop. <clears throat> Band Anna is the next track produced by Derringer, who's the primary producer for the Griselda group themselves. Uh, awesome, awesome beat. One of the best beats on the album, very far out and cartoony, with these Asian symbols and percussion. Starts off with this chorus, just bands on top of bands on top of bands. Very catchy, again, talking about money. And then he makes a very important point here. 
he says about, the lyric is, got done with it, school of hard knocks, Reaganomics in the A, S is hard on ends. And for this, I just want to remind you, uh, last week, my dad took this out for me. He reads the, the New York Times. So this is, you can read, A Bloody History of U.S. Influence uh, Hangs Over Haiti. The mention of Reagan and Reaganomics is not unintentional. Now, on the one hand, Reagan's belief in trickle-down economics is one of the primary sources that created the wealth gap that still exists, that grew over the 1980s, that led to this great division between the haves and have-nots his permissive slash potentially intentionally responsible for uh, uh, the crack epidemic also fed in to this entire area. All of gangster rap, all of crack rap owes its lineage really back to Ronald Reagan. But it goes deeper than this. Before Ronald Reagan was elected, Jimmy Carter was president of the United States, and he was actually pushing on the Duvalier. He was pushing on them to do things better, to be more open, to have a more free and just society. When Reagan was elected, like many other Republican uh, politicians, all he cared about was no communism. If you weren't a communist, you could do what you want. We helped put Ceci Seiko in power uh, in Zahir because, hey, he wasn't going to be a communist. And the Duvalier, both the father and son, knew how to play America against their own interests, knew how to play America by flirting with communism and making sure that supporting them was fighting the Russians. So... When Reagan came to power, a huge stamp down on civil liberties happened in Haiti because all of a sudden they knew that foreign aid would not dry up. As long as they didn't go communist, as long as they didn't go red, they could do what they wanted to their people, which then led to a mass exodus from Haiti to America. One of the reasons there are so many boat people in America was because of Reagan being more permissive of the uh, intolerable cruelty of the Duvalier. And then, who cracked down on immigration? Who cracked down on the boat people? Who put the squeeze on the people who were getting the squeeze in the first place? How many different ways can one American president hurt the people of Haiti without even being in the history books? When you read about things Reagan did and didn't do, you don't read about what he did to Haiti. Nobody says about what anybody did to Haiti. Reaganomics, it's hard on a... Mm. <laughs> I can't say any of these words because I try and keep a clear channel, but very much 1980, the marriage of the Duvalier and the arrival of Ronald Reagan meant that this diaspora was both going to expand while also being consciously clamped down on by the American government, which led to a lot more people drowning uh, off the Florida coast. That's all. That's all that little little random reference to Reagan is just in there. Just, just throw them out there. Because what's the other side? Reagan's belief in greed and power and accumulating money and ex exerting dominance over people who have less than you is also the very values that inform gangster rap in the first place. One could make a very credible case that Makami's music and his approach is Reagan-esque. Very complex, very difficult, hard to square kind of like the legacy of uh, Madame Duvalier herself. I like in Bandana how he sings for most of the first verse, and then he kind of detunes it and has this kind of throwaway verse at the end. And then as if to really drive home this concept about the song being partially about the wealth gap, we have this discussion of this charity dinner that Michelle Bennett threw, which some people think caused the Duvalier to be overthrown by the Haitian people. A $500 dinner, which someone referred to as if, if Nero were alive in 1985, that's what he would do. Next track is called Thank God. More singing, rapping over nice guitar and soul sample. Just all the way throughout, I mean, when we think about the, the influence of Kanye on hip-hop music and the way that Kanye changed, thank God he at least existed to use soul samples in this way to sort of free up the soul sample, one line, two line, change the pitch if you need, because it really helps to sort of be this great connection between the old school jazzy samples and the hard, you know, new school beats. It's kind of a defeated song, thank God. It's about all the things that he wanted. You know, at a certain point, he even has this kind of like fast rapping section. He talks about how all he wanted was isotoners. This is the greatest piece of evidence that Makami and Professor Sky are the same age. <laughs> 
And again, I don't know if he's 31 or 45. I don't know. But Isotoner gloves are these gloves which were advertised like hell in the 1980s. It seemed like every time you watched the Transformers, every time you watched Inspector Gadget, every time you watched 60 Minutes, whatever it was, Cheers, Cosby Show, there'd be a commercial, usually starring Dan Marino, the quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, hold, you know, showing off his fancy gloves. Absolutely a very clear reference to me as a kid from the 80s. The next song is not a song. It's called Food Pyramid, and it's just an interstitial moment. It's another interlude. And what's fascinating here is the rest of the interludes have been attached either at the front or the back of another song. This one is its own song, and it comes from The Sopranos. Now, give me a second here. You may or may not know, I just, I just posted a video on my uh, spam channel about The Sopranos. I like The Sopranos quite a bit. When I think about Newark and when I think about New Jersey, I now think about two things. Makami and The Sopranos. I think this is an intentional callback, but the quote itself is fascinating. It comes from an episode where Tony is upset that his crime family is not making as much money as they used to. And all of his capos, all of his captains say, well, it's because of the, the recession. It's after 2008, right? And you hear Tony, don't talk to me about the effing economy. And then he asks Silvio, what two areas of the economy are recession proof? To which Silvio says, Certain, which by the way, that means that uh, Bruce Springsteen guitar player is now on a Mock Homie album. That's funny. Certain aspects of the show business and our thing. Those are the two things which are safe from the recession. Certain aspects of the show business and our thing. I think we could rename this album if we wanted to, to certain aspects of show business and our thing. That's what it is. Certain aspects of show business are what keeps Mock Homie rich and successful, and our thing, meaning crime, organized crime, is also his thing. So it seems like it's kind of a throwaway badass quote, but I don't think it is. I think it's very intentional. I think it's putting him in this lineage of, of New Jersey gangsters while also emphasizing that he does both of these things. He is part of our thing, and he is part of certain aspects of show business. Next song is Capiche. Odd sample to start with these like strings, organ, and harpsichord, and then it cuts out. Until eventually we have another Brooklyn gangster rap god of the 90s, Jay-Z, and his vocal sample, I'm on my grind, cousin, got no time for fronting. These are all very intentional, right? These quoting of, of, of Biggie, the quoting of Jay-Z, on Pray for Haiti, he'll quote uh, Tupac as well, really trying to connect himself to this kind of golden era of American gangster rap. I apologize for the downstairs noise. They stopped making music, but they are not stopping talking. Loud, loud boys down there. It's okay, at least they're making music. Now what's funny here is in this hook, we have I'm on my grind cousin, no time for fronting. Also, we have the beginning lyrics, all you ends pretending with the presidential super PAC, fundraising events with extenders, including tax. If this album was recorded in 2016, what rappers were part of presidential super PACs and really being out there politically trying to give a lot of money to help Democratic politicians? The number one voice, the number one name that comes to mind is Jay-Z. So it seems like he's sampling old Jay-Z, you know, blueprint era Jay-Z, while also potentially criticizing modern 2016 Jay-Z. The second verse starts with a slight island accent. I don't know, he does this every once in a while. And just some of the hardest rhymes on the entire album. Mr. T with the iced out thumb ring, the chicken and the dumpling. The remix to Ignition with the drum ting. We start and we finish when we want, King. Fronting will only get you 10% of nothing. You keep appealing to these ducklings. I bet they find you face down in the mainstream floating. Trust me. Just a wonderful line. This image of ducks appears quite often, I guess in duck season as well, and the idea of these, these people who are just trying to be on the mainstream while he's doing so much more. Fronting will only get you 10% of nothing. That's just a great line. I feel like I should, I should, like whenever, you know, when you're a dad, you know, you often try to like make sure your kids are telling the truth and, and always being 100% honest. You know, did you clean your room? Yes. Did you also put away your clothes? No, well, that's part of cleaning up. Fronting will get you 10% of nothing. And then it ends with a whole interview with Jay-Z. 
talking about how we've never seen the maturation of hip hop. And I love this because obviously Jay-Z is insanely intelligent. And he's pointing out the issue that hip hop is only 30 years old when he recorded that interview and we haven't seen people grow. And Jay-Z is one of the few examples where we start to see what a rapper can be when they get older. Of the old school, only LL Cool J was permitted to have a career outside of the 1980s and early 90s. Right? The whole opening Grandmaster Flash and Curtis Blow and the Fat Boys and Run DMC, like, you're done. Like, you're done, you're done, you're the old school, you're done. But ever since then, we do have rappers who continue to have careers for decades. The album closes with another Derringer track, Bloody Penthouse. This cool kind of story, kind of a low-key flow. It's like an interesting love story at the beginning. Boy meets girl, girl blushing, but boy can't tell because she's blacker than an oven. This is an interesting idea because um, it's, it's a war blushing is a fascinating thing. I actually, in grad school, one of my thesis advisors, um, actually, no, she wasn't my thesis advisor, but she was the teacher of 18th century uh, literature at the school where I went. She had an entire thesis, you know, 200 page thesis. Something's funny down there. A 200 page thesis all about blushing and the way that it existed in 18th century novels because blushing betrays something when people don't want to, like people don't want to show their emotions. So blushing is involuntary and it often shows the truth when we're trying to present a mask. I teach about that and I also teach the verb rougir in French for blushing but I've come to realize how odd it is because, you know, many of my students are not white. So the darker your skin is, the less evident it is that you're blushing. So it's this weird sort of vocab word to teach, which speaks to a kind of Eurocentric vision of language and of culture. And so here I am in the middle of this song <laughs> with this idea, boy meets girl, girl blushing, because of course everybody blushes. It's just how evident is it? It's amazing. A beautiful, uh, beautiful chorus, probably my favorite singing on the album, uh, Penthouse, uh, Bloody, a very gross image. Uh, the last verse makes reference to Wave It Like Matumbo. Is this the first rap reference to Dikembe Matumbo? I don't know. It was five years ago. It seems like everybody is talking about Matumbo now, but that's also partly because he was on one of those Geico commercials. <laughs> that was before the Twilight Zone. The last verse on the album, I believe he says, Drake and Future in the car, so what do you do inside the club? I don't, I don't quite know. So like, is that like talking about like the music you listen to, like this mainstream lame music that you listen to in the cars, and why would you even go to a club? I play GXFR all day, I meaning I play Griselda all day. I went to GS and then to ACP mess with your Kevlar don't play. I let my bullets charge in the Ogun Shrine. Ogun Shrine, that's a, uh, like a voodoo shrine. Write your name on the boulevard in the cul-de-sac, eau de toi, let the AR spray like golden eye. So, so write your name on the boulevard in the cul-de-sac, eau de toi. So like that, eau de toilette is how you talk about like perfume, okay? So eau de toi means like the, the water of you. Eau de toi, so then he, he turns into two different words, you see, look. Eau de toilette. Let the air spray. So he's taking like a French word and then taking the second half of the French word and turning it into the beginning of an English word. Pretty, pretty astounding. It ends the whole album with people attacking Michelle Duvalier, calling her a prostitute, calling her a lesbian, accusing her of all sorts of things that they perceive of to be bad and a moral failing. And it's a reminder of the position of Michelle Duvalier, of what she is in Haitian culture. Most often, she's a scapegoat. A scapegoat for the entire Duvalier regime, a place where people can put all of their anger at being ruled under a couple different iron thumbs, a couple different iron fists uh, for several, several decades. Instead of worrying about Reagan, instead of worrying about Kennedy, instead of worrying about the rest of the American presidents who let this go on, instead of worrying about the Duvaliers themselves, we can just say, look at her, she's a prostitute who buys fur coats. She must be the problem. So there you go. There's the end of my review. I might end up having to re-record this. You tell me if it's too distracting, because I got this new microphone now. Maybe it's picking up all their conversations perfectly. 
I did want to say thank you to all my uh, Patreons. I, I got a new list here for all my Patreons. I'll try not to have them upside down. So uh, thank you to all these guys. Uh, they give me money, and then I use that money to buy music. I got a new one down there. Uh, 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 Kurik and Tatsu123, they're new. And so's uh, Ken Dyer. And actually, this whole sheet I had upside down on my last video, so I apologize about that. So thank you to all these people. Really appreciate your help. Really appreciate your support. Feel free to support me if you want to help me buy music. Okay. <sighs> Until next time, well, I'm probably going to have to review NOS again. Get to open up the NOS debate one more time. There's the camera, and there's the microphone. <laughs>